This is Fresh Air. I'm Terry Gross. The new movie, 12 Years a Slave, was described by David Denby in The New Yorker as easily the greatest feature film ever made about American slavery. My guests are the star of the film, Chiwetel Ejiofor, and its director, Steve McQueen. The movie is adapted from the 1853 memoir by Solomon Northup. Northup had been a free black man in upstate New York, a husband and father. He was literate. He was a working man who also made money as a fiddler. But in 1841, after being lured to Washington, D.C., with the promise of several days' work fiddling with the circus, he was kidnapped into slavery. Over the next 12 years, before finally winning his freedom, he became the property of a series of different plantation owners, one who was especially cruel and brutal. Chiwetel Ejiofor's other films include Dirty Pretty Things, Kinky Boots, and Children of Men. He's now starring in Dancing on the Edge, the new Stars Network series about a black band leader in London in the 1930s. Director Steve McQueen's other films are Shame, about a sex addict, and Hunger, based on the story of Bobby Sands, who died leading a hunger strike of imprisoned IRA members protesting their treatment. Let's start with a clip from 12 Years a Slave, just after Solomon Northup has been kidnapped and sold to slave traders and is on a ship heading toward Louisiana. He's talking to other slaves on the ship. Days ago, I was with my family in my home. Now you tell me all is lost. Tell no one who I am. That's the way to survive. Well, I don't want to survive. I want to live. Steve McQueen, Chiwetel Ejiofor, welcome to Fresh Air. Um, Steve McQueen, let me start with you. Why did you want to make a film adaptation of a memoir by mm -hmm. a free man from the North who was kidnapped into slavery? Why did you choose that yeah. book? Well, I, what happened originally is I, I, I had an idea of um, having a free man from the North because I was just thinking about ideas and how, 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 how I can have an in into the narrative. A free man from the North who gets kidnapped and pulled into the maze of slavery. And I, li I like the idea that the audience follows this person in every step that he takes within the context of slavery, um, just to illuminate what that world was. And I was having a bit of difficulty. I was working with John Riley on the script. Uh, it was having, we were having a little bit of difficulty. And my wife said to me, well, why don't you look into first-hand accounts of slavery? I thought, oh, yeah, of course. And uh, she did some research. I did some research, but she found this book called 12 Years a Slave. And I read this book, and I was totally stunned. It was like something sort of uh, a bolt coming out of the sky. And at the same time, I was pretty upset with myself that I didn't know this book. How come I did not know this book? And... Uh, Slowly but surely, I, I realized that most people, in fact, all the people I knew did not know this book. And, you know, I, 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 I live in Amsterdam where Anne Frank is a, is a national hero. She's not just a national hero, she's a world hero. And for me, this book read like Anne Frank's diary, but written 97 years before, a, f a first-hand account of slavery. And um, I basically made it my passion to make this book into a film. Steve McQueen, uh, I know one of your parents is from... Uh, Grenada and one from Trinidad, so they're both from islands in the Caribbean. Were their ancestors slaves? Do you know? Yes, of course. Yes, they were. They were, they were slaves. Um, I mean, my trajectory, as such, um, of being introduced to slavery was fairly immediate, because my parents were from the West Indies, and uh, you know, at school there was reference to slavery, but not much. Um, so it's one of those things which we, I found out through my parents and uh, obviously traveling back to the West Indies and, and, and uh, you know, I have a family tree going back to the first um, African on my mother's side who came from Ghana. Uh, so it's one of those things which I had definitely had the connection with. Um, and I mean, the only difference I would say that anything between myself and African American is their boat went right and my boat went left. Chewy Telegia, for your parents are from Nigeria. I know your father is is no longer alive, but um, did they tell you anything about what they learned about the slave trade from an African perspective? Well, my father was a great believer in uh, in the in the ideas of uh, African kind of um, 
diaspora, of a, of a, of a sense of unity amongst African people and people of African heritage. And, uh, uh, and that's what I, that was the attitude, I suppose, that I, that I grew up with, that, that, um, that we're all, that we were all united in this, uh, uh, it was almost, almost by this thing, uh, even though we were then spread across the world because of it, you know. So, um, you know, that was their, that was their attitude. They were also aware of the, you know, the, the number of people from Nigeria who were taken out of Nigeria, uh, and the Bight of Benin and, 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 um, taken over to, uh, to America and to, um, uh, to the West Indies. Um, you know, this all was kind of very, came to me very specifically when I was in Calabar, when I was in Nigeria and I was at the slave, uh, the slave museum in Calabar finishing a film there. And on my last day, because I was heading over down towards Louisiana to start shooting on this, I went to the Slave Museum, and there with the, just the list, these roll calls of people, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people taken out of that area. And so, you know, b- being of Nigerian heritage, going over to Louisiana, you just start to feel connected to the whole sense of it, to the international nature of it, to the complete sort of absence of humanity that surrounded it. I think of 12 Years a Slave as a very experiential film, and it's it's much more about Solomon Northup's experience as a slave than it is about like the larger historical context of slavery. And um, should we tell you for what that meant for you is that you're going to be doing a lot of suffering on camera. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, like it's you, you your body is put through so much. Um, and I'm you know just like one example is early in the film when you're after you're kidnapped you are. Uh, beaten with a plank of wood and beaten so hard that the wood breaks. Um, there's whippings and, and and near hanging. And were you uncomfortable uh, about the idea of taking on a role in which you knew you'd have to endure m- so much suffering? Because I'm sure, even though obviously you weren't really physically injured in the way that your character is, you emotionally had to experience that to the uh, extent that you're capable of as an actor. Yeah, the um, you know th- those aspects of the film um, um, are, you know, I suppose in a way, ne- I mean they're very necessary for to kind of understand uh, Solomon's psychological journey. You know, to understand who he is, what he's endured, and actually in a wider sense, what what people endured, what people endured in that time. And I think that um, it gave audiences and gives audiences a chance to really understand the inner workings of what's happening, and so. You know, those sequences ended up having a sense of privilege about them, actually. And, uh, and you know, and, I, and it sort of, you know, I think if you're playing somebody, if you're playing a real person, you're, you're always seeking to, in a way, legitimize your relationship with that person, you know, to, uh, to have the right to tell their story. And I felt that sometimes when we were doing things that Solomon describes in the book that he, uh, that he went through, and we were recreating these moments as uh, accurately as we could, and that would mean me being uncomfortable. What it meant was it was it sort of legitimized our relationship, and it made it easier for me to to walk with him and to tell his story. There's a scene I want to ask you about that's a real kind of emotional uh, turning point for Solomon Northup in the film. He is forced to whip a young woman who he's very fond of. And he knows that if he doesn't whip her, that the slave master will do it. Um, so, like, he figures, you know, he'll whip her lightly. But he can't get away with that. The slave owner demands a harsher whipping. And um, I, I think that would be a very telling point in the emotional life of Solomon Northup. And I was wondering if you could each talk about what that scene meant to you that that he was put in the position of knowing that things would be even worse if he didn't whip her himself well i think you know it's it's this is what we're talking about i mean this is why people were kept in captivity for 400 years because of those kind of events um this and this is this is a true event um so what happened at that scene is that you know Epps, the, the the slave master you're, you're talking about, says to him, "If he doesn't do it, he will kill everyone here." What choice does he have? I mean, these are kind of choices that have been made, unfortunately, throughout history, throughout the most horrendous moments in history, that people do in order to survive. 
it's almost uh, you know the thing is that it's not necessarily <clears throat> what Epps, uh, the plantation owner, is going for. He's not necessarily doing this in order to hurt Solomon psychologically. He is going through his own crisis in the sense that he is um, in love with this girl, with Patsy, his, his, his the slave girl. And he is in such kind of conflict and, and anger and self-hatred about that that in the moment, even though he wants to whip her, he can't. And he's, he, he's, he's unable to, to, to do it, um, which is why he sort of almost casually turns to Solomon and, and orders him to. Uh, and then what that does, of course, to Solomon is this: it's that sort of the, it's the physical and the psychological, and that is, I think, what is always in balance and always in play in these places, in these scenes, and in the book, uh, and in the way that Solomon describes what is happening is that the, there's the physical aspect of it, but there's also the psychological. And in a way, I think that Solomon was able to, at that point, had found ways of protecting himself from Master Epps, of protecting himself physically, from protecting himself emotionally, protecting himself psychologically. But this was something else. This was something he did not envisage, that uh, that he would have to be, be forced to participate in injuring somebody that he cared so deeply about. So it's uh, it, it, in a sense, it just speaks to all the levels of captivity and, and the three-dimensional nature of, of what was going on. You might, Steve McQueen, you might really disagree with me on this, but having seen all three of your movies, Hunger, about Bobby Sands, who's played by um, uh, Michael Fassbender. Michael Fassbender. I mean, Michael Fassbender is absolutely skeletal by the time the movie ends. And then Michael Fassbender stars again in Shame, in which he's, he's um, I guess you'd call him a, a sex addict, but I, I, it's hard to say if he gets any pleasure out of sex. I mean, it's a compulsion that he has to follow. Well, after a while, but, most addicts don't get pleasure. Yes, out of exactly. What they do. It exactly. becomes a necessity. Exactly. Um, and now, uh, Twelve Years a Slave, in which there's, you know, again, very like, physical suffering. And so I can't help but think there's something that interests you about psychic and physical suffering. And th- that your movies are all about the body in some way, you know, the hunger strike, the sexual compulsion the physical endurance of somebody who is a slave, but their body and spirit manages to survive. Um, no, listen, I'm interested in you know, the hunger strike. It was the, the biggest thing politically that happened in Britain in the past 27 years. Ten men dying of hunger in a British prison cell. It was deafening, but no one was speaking about it. That's why I made the picture. Um, as far as shame was concerned, it you know, this this phenomenon um, about sex addiction. Um, and I wanted to investigate that because it's something that everyone has a relationship with, sex. And it was, again, it was just this, this, this elephant in the room. And I, that's what I wanted to make the picture about because it was it was about this uh, this addiction which was has been sort of, um, how can I say, uh, has been thriving also due to the internet. Um, and slavery, well, I mean, I don't know how obvious you could be I mean, all you got to do is walk down the street and you see the evidence of slavery in, in, in everyday life. But there's a huge silence about it. It's, it's, it's a deafening silence about it. You know, why are the, the pop, uh, prison population of black males so huge? Why is poverty in black community so huge? Why is mental health? Why is education so poor? Why? And when you ask yourself that question, it all leads down to what happened in slavery because no one... Has you know once it was, you know once it has stopped, <laughs> you know everyone was left to get on with their own devices, but without a platform, without a leg up, and there you have the evidence of slavery. So these are huge events, deafening events, which I feel needed a platform, and the only platform for me as an artist was cinema because the, for me it's 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 it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the greatest art form there is. The question is you know why hasn't there been a film? like this on slavery. One of the things that you do in some of your movies and certainly in in 12 Years a Slave is have scenes last a little longer than we'd expect. Um, and Because things are edited so quickly now. I mean, like, there's a lot of movies that are... Scenes last for such a short period of time, and the same goes for a lot of um, TV shows, particularly um, comedy series now. And... There are a few scenes, um, without mentioning by, them by name, in which something terrible is being endured. And just as we think, like, oh, the scene's going to end, it doesn't. And 
you keep our eye on that scene longer than we expected and longer than is comfortable, which I think is very intentional on your part because you want it to be more uncomfortable than just uh, it's another movie scene. But also to be present, I think it's not just yes. It's, it, that, those are the you, those are the sort of fundamentals of it. But the, the, what what it's to do is to is to do with being present as a as 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 a viewer, to being there, um, to shoot things in real time, rather than movie time. So, for example, the 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 the, the sequence where Pat is getting whipped, that we spoke about before, to be present within that, and to sort of um, that shot, I think, is ten minutes, to be present in that is to sort of lose the frame and to be to hold the tension and to not you know to be there in in in, in a kind of in, in a kind of reality that's what i want that's the cho that was the chosen effect that i wanted and it works in, for me it works in a way because it doesn't allow the viewer off the hook in shooting the movie um S steve mcqueen y you have a, a, an incredible eye um in making films and um uh i'm wondering if you referred to um, uh, daguerreotype photographs or old paintings or any any other historical artifacts to no, um, no, it was, no, no it, it was the state of Louisiana it was New Orleans it was those plantations it was that that sort of uh, the, I, with myself and Sean Bonnet my cameraman who working with for 13 years we, we, it, it was just the environment the landscape that sort of was so rich and um, that it just lent to so many ideas and images, um, you know, as we went in there naked and came out there fully clothed, it was just amazing how, you know, you just look at things and you find things in that environment. It was so rich, and of course, like I said, you know, before the most beautiful, horrible things happen in the most beautiful places. It was just so rich, and the sound of the cicadas, um, they, they almost act like a, a, a choir at, at, at certain points. I mean, it was kind of amazing, amazing. Um, did you see, besides being on the on like former plantations in Louisiana where you shot, did you see any other artifacts of slavery that survive? Yes, yes we saw the actual slave shacks. There were a lot of um, slave shacks which are still there, which in this I think in the, they were vacated. I mean, what happened was that after the slave shacks were built, they were they were there. So what happened was, I think people actually lived in them for for, for a while, and I think that they were like vacated. Uh, during the sort of uh, late late uh, late seventies, I think last people living in them, living in them since the late seventies, but they were there, and you had these shotgun houses there still there too. It was it was it was pretty incredible. It's a shame that they're not being looked after very well. Of course, they've been left to sort of the elements, um, but there you have it. So, in getting back to the idea that you want us to experience what slavery was like, and I think that happens, and it's it's um difficult to endure. It's a, it's a very painful film to watch because you are putting yourself as a viewer in in the shoes of Solomon Northup. And what, what makes it, as, you know, especially easy, I think, for everybody to do that is he starts as a free man. And you know, like, well, you're, you're a free person. He was a free person. And imagine what it would be like to suddenly be a slave. I mean, it's just so easy to identify whether you are descendant from a slave or not. Um, but there's so much suffering that you endure secondhand in watching the movie. And um, I, I guess I'm wondering, where is the line for you between like, how much you want to put your audience through and how much is just going to be like a little too much for a film? Did, did you, is that the kind of thing you think um, about when setting out to make a film like this? Well, yeah, I think when you, if you read the book, it's a lot. It's too much. And actually, there are five acts of violence in the whole film five in two hours and 11 minutes but it's to do with the context and that's that's the issue because i think people don't want to think of the past don't they would rather be blind and to sort of look at what the evidence of things which are around them people don't want that responsibility they would rather look at a horror movie or a thriller and people get shot in the head every 15 minutes but you know i feel that you know it's like looking at Schindler's List or looking at The Pianist or looking at whatever Holocaust film there is. That's our responsibility as humans to sort of reflect on our recent past in order to find out where we are and where we're going, particularly with this particular subject because it seems that there's a huge sort of, um, I wouldn't say ambivalence, I would just say a huge sort of not wanting to look at oneself, but it's important. 
Well, I want to thank you both so much for talking with us. Thank Pleasure. you so thank much. You. Chiwetel Ejiofor stars in the new film 12 Years a Slave. Steve McQueen directed the film. We'll talk with a historian about slavery in the second half of the show. I'm Terry Gross, and this is Fresh Air.